Well, Merry Christmas. All right. Well, I don't know about you, but um, I often wonder what I'm going to feel like on Christmas. You know, am I going to feel, you know, excited? Am I going to feel kind of blah? Am I going to wake up sick or am I going to wake up healthy? Um, Is it going to be a super fun time? Um, You know, there's all sorts of different emotions you can have uh, on Christmas Day. And I find a lot of it has to do with uh, what your expectations are. If you set your expectations differently. I know when, when you're a child, you're, you're excited about the big gift under the tree, right? You hope it's for you. Um, so, but at some point, I hope that you take time uh, in your celebration to pause and to have a, a moment of clarity, per se, or just to, to reflect and to think, what is this all about? Uh, sometimes we can get confused, Uh, not intentionally so, but maybe after the gifts have been unwrapped, the boxes all broken down, uh, you finally finish emptying all of the alarm clocks and flashlights around your house to find batteries (laughs) for those toys that you thought didn't take batteries that do take batteries. But I hope at some point you'll be able to stop and pause and reflect on what is the real reason that we're gathered? What, what's the real reason for having family? What's the real reason for the, for the gifts and for, for the joyous celebration? And uh, it's the person of Jesus, and I want to talk about that this morning. Um, I hope you will consider uh, not just a momentary response to Christmas. So, you know, at Christmas time, there's a lot of response, right? Um, family comes in. We do a lot of unique things around Christmas time. We do some traditions, we do some things that we try to get everybody involved in. And I think sometimes we can associate um, how much we treasure Jesus by our Christmas spirit and by our holiday traditions and if we've gone to church for Christmas. Um, But I would suggest that actually a a real response to the Christ of Christmas uh, would be seen all year long. In, in, in the months following Christmas, not just around the Christmas season when there's a little bit of that um, feeling that comes with the holidays. And to that point, uh, we are going to talk uh, this morning, we're going to look at the responses to Christ that are seen in the Gospels of Matthew and the, the Gospel of Luke. So the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. I believe that these writers um, were intent on getting a response from their readers, okay? Uh, often the, the, the writers are called the evangelists, okay? And the reason they're called the evangelists is because they were proclaimers of the gospel. And they wrote the gospels in order to convince you of the truth of Jesus Christ. They wrote these, these, uh, these books about Jesus, these stories, these narratives of Jesus' life, to persuade you, to convince you, and to bring you to a point where you will do something with the person of Jesus, where you will respond. As Scott mentioned uh, there in the beginning of the, the, his introduction, you'll respond in one of two ways. You'll receive him or you'll reject him. They want to convince you, and Luke specifically wants to convince you that Jesus is indeed, he's the savior of the world. Now it's important as we look at these narratives to realize that neither of these accounts are are trying to um, be exhaustive regarding the birth and the the young life of Jesus. Rather, the details that are included are there to help the specific theological purposes that the author has in mind. So Matthew has a particular purpose, and Luke has a particular purpose. In the Gospel of Matthew, uh, Matthew is focusing in on Jesus, his royal messiahship. And that's going to be throughout his entire book. We're going to see lots of thematic things about kingdom and about Jesus the Messiah. There's even a focus in the beginning there with the birth of Jesus on Joseph and his lineage. In Luke... We have a focus, Luke is a Gentile, we have a focus on salvation for the whole world, okay? Luke um, is focused on historical veracity, not that the others were not, 
but he's focused in particular on, on compiling a, a, a narrative that he, he uses other sources. He says so in the very beginning. He says his goal is to convince somebody of certainty. In fact, I want you to look at that. Look at Luke chapter 1. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verse 4, he's, Luke had, has set up in the intro here, he's writing to this person by the name of Theophilus. It's a great name, by the way, Theophilus. Okay? Um, and he's writing these things, that you may have certainty. He doesn't say probability, that's kind of interesting. Okay? He doesn't say probability, but he says certainty. That you may have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. Right? So Luke is intentionally going to structure his entire gospel um, so that you can know that these things really did happen. There's a historical veracity that he's burdened with. Luke is also an artist. Um, some of our favorite stories come from Luke. Some of the unique parables are, are found in Luke. Um, it's interesting, you look at Luke versus Mark. <laughs> uh, Mark is like very short and sweet and to the point. Luke kind of tells these, these stories in, in beautiful ways. Uh, some of our favorites, like the prodigal son, they're only found in, in Luke. Well, what's my goal for us today during this time? What I want to do is I want to look, I want to go back and forth between Matthew and Luke, and I want to look at the varied responses to Jesus' birth that are presented to us in these two accounts. We're going to quickly overview them. We'll kind of go through each of them, and I want to, I'm going to try to do it in sequence, okay? There, which means we're going to go back and forth. Uh, they're not all presented just in one timeline. <clears throat> uh, and then for the majority of the time, we will zoom in on a particular story, the story of the shepherds and their introduction to Jesus found in Luke. But it's interesting, and I think you all will see it as we go, that, that every person who comes into contact with Jesus who whether it's an, an announcement or whether it's an introduction, responds. They respond in some way to the Christ of Christmas. So let's pray. Would you pray with me? And then we will jump into kind of an overview looking at the various responses, all right? Father, would you help us this morning as we look into your word? I pray that your spirit <clears throat> would help us. Lord, if your spirit does not work in our hearts to convict, to convince to assure, to encourage, um, then, Lord, we, we're wasting our time. So, Lord, we ask that your spirit would work, that it would take the, the, the scripture, the words, and encourage our hearts. Lord, I pray that you'd help all of us to evaluate our own life responses to the Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, if we're going to go in a timeline fashion, flip over to Luke chapter, <clears throat> chapter. well, you don't have to flip, it's Luke 1, okay, but you might need to flip a page. And we're going to, we're going to look at one announcement that's kind of the precursor to the announcements about Jesus, and that's the announcement of John the Baptist to Zechariah. Now you say, why are you bringing this one up? Well, the way Luke does it, <clears throat> he keeps going back and forth between John the Baptist and Jesus, and he, he, he does it intentionally. He goes back and forth. There's the, there's the announcement about John the Baptist, then there's the announcement of Jesus. Then there's the birth of John the Baptist, and then there's the birth of Jesus. There's the, uh, he, he talks about the um, childhood of John the Baptist in like one verse, and he talks about the childhood of Jesus in just about one verse, and then there's one story that's told. He's going back and forth, back and forth, introducing you to these characters that are so crucial then throughout the rest of his book. So when we look at John the Baptist, the announcement to Zechariah, the reason why I'm wanting to bring this up is because in, in verse 18, okay, Zechariah is a priest, he's in the temple, and the angel of the Lord appears to him, or, the, or an angel appears to him and tells him that, that he's going to be having a child. Verse 18, and Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. And I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent 
and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because, and here's what I want you to notice, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So this announcement to John the Baptist, of John the Baptist to Zechariah, we see fear initially when the angel comes. There's unbelief. Then there's this correction. And then at the end of that particular story, when John the Baptist is born uh, and, and Zechariah writes out the name, the, the family's trying to name him something different, Zechariah obeys. And he says, no, we're going to name him John. And the whole family's like, why John? That's a dumb name. And he's like, no, we're going to name him John. And right then his tongue is loosed and he praises God with a hymn. So we see fear, unbelief, correction, and then followed by faith and obedience. Okay? Now we have the announcement to Mary. Okay? So if you look at if you look at Mary's uh, the, the birth of Jesus foretold, it's also in Luke chapter 1. The angel comes to Mary and says, Greetings, O favored one. Verse 28. And again, we see a similar sequence. Mary is at first fearful. And she even says this in verse 34. And Mary says to the angel, well, how will this be since I'm a virgin? So we see she actually has a question too. However, it's, just, it's different than Zachariah's question. It's not a question of unbelief. The angel does not reprimand her for unbelief, but rather instructs her. And we see her belief and obedience. Verse 38, Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departs from her. Go to Matthew chapter 1. Joseph, the son of David, is sleeping. And an angel appears to him in a dream. And says, hey, don't be afraid to take Mary for your wife. She will bear a son, you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place, Matthew includes uh, fulfillment of prophecy here, but then verse 24, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took her as his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now in this particular instance, Joseph, there's no comment there's no response. Maybe it was because he was sleeping. <laughs> okay, but Joseph is, is, has this uh, dream, and then he responds in obedience. Go back to chapter of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, we have the announcement to the shepherds. So the shepherds are out on the fields, verse 8, keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appears to them. And the angel says, uh, don't, don't fear, because right? their initial response is, again, it's, it's fear. And the angel proceeds with the announcement and continues to tell them about this good news of great joy, this, this Christ child that would be born. And it's interesting, the shepherds say, hey, let's go check it out. Let's go see. Let's go see this thing which the Lord has made known to us. And so the shepherds, there's fear, but then there's investigation in response to the announcement. Go back to Matthew. I told you we were going to do this. We'll be done shortly, though. Matthew chapter 2. We have the announcement of Jesus to the, the wise men. Now, the, you say an announcement. Well, it wasn't, really wasn't an announcement. In many ways, God used the wise men to announce to Herod in Jerusalem about Jesus. And we'll actually see what their responses are. Chapter 2 of Matthew says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying... Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Interesting. So Herod and all Jerusalem, they're troubled at this idea of this king who's been born. So then Herod does some research. He does some investigation. He calls the chief priests and scribes to him. And he asks them, so what's the deal? <laughs> tell me, what's the inside scoop on this Messiah character? And they tell him, well, he's going to be born in Bethlehem. So then Herod secretly calls the wise men in, asks them about, well, when did you see the star up here? And he tells them, go, go find him. And when you find him, come back and tell me because I want to worship him too. Okay? So then, 
After listening to the king, they go out. Behold, the star that they had seen, it rose and went before them. Okay, when they saw the star, they, were, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy, verse 10. And, they, and going to the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then they gave gifts to him, and then they were warned in a dream not to go back to Herod. Okay, so we see some more responses to this. By the way, I know that the wise men kind of kind of get, you know, thrown under the bus a lot because they weren't at the, the shepherd scene. This was a few years later, it would seem, okay? All right, we've got a couple more here to go. Uh, go back to Luke. We'll stay in Luke for the remainder of them. I kind of split the shepherds into two. There was the, there was the uh, announcement, but then they actually meet Jesus. Okay, so after they've gone over and looked, it says this, verse 17, or verse 16, they went and with haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. Hey, we just heard about this. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. In verse 20, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Just for speed, I'll just tell you the other two here. We've got the introduction of Jesus to Elizabeth. I kind of skipped that one. That's in the womb, right? When, G- when uh, Elizabeth first meets, but as soon as she, as soon as she uh, sees Mary and the baby inside of her leaps at Jesus' presence, she breaks out into song. Luke is interesting, by the way. It's like the precursor to the, to the musical, right, to the Broadway. If you're reading through this, it's like every, it seems like every major event, all of a sudden they break out into this hymn, into this song. You kind of, I can imagine it, right? Them just kind of stepping off and the light kind of shining on them and all of a sudden, you know, Mary gives her song and then Elizabeth gives hers, and then Zechariah gives hers, and then it goes back and forth between all of these, um, these hymns that are given. Jesus is actually introduced to Mary. So finally Mary gets to meet the baby that she's been carrying, and it says that she ponders these things in her heart. She's excited about these things. Um, down in chapter 2, a little bit farther now. Okay, so now Jesus is, the, the, the scene from the, um, the shepherds is, is gone, and now they've brought Jesus um, to the temple to be obedient to Jewish law. And we meet another character. His name is Simeon. Verse 25, now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, and then here's another one of those song moments, right? Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles And for glory to your people, Israel. And he continues then on and he tells Mary some more about Jesus. And then lastly, we have one more person introduced, and that is Anna. There's a prophetess, Anna. Okay? And she's she's an older lady. Verse 37, she did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour... She began to give thanks to God and speak of him, that is Jesus, to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. Okay. We just, I just introduced you to a whole bunch of characters that all kind of, the, the focal point of, of Matthew and, and Luke in, in the birth of Jesus, all these characters play a part. They all play a role. And they all have various responses, but there are some some things I think as we look through their responses that we can conclude. There's some, some observations we can make. And really the question I want to ask is this, why? Why do most of them respond in worship and trust? Like what is it about this introduction or the, even the announcements that were made that caused these people, these individuals, to respond with, with worship, some of them singing or, 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 you know, all of a sudden speaking hymns. Um, 
Some of them going out immediately and telling other people about this person. What was it about Jesus, about this whole scenario that caused all of this? And I think there's three primary things. Okay, first of all, Jesus is a humble savior for the humble. Jesus is a humble savior for the humble. Now, the, the, the narrative we're going to kind of zoom in on now for the, re- the remainder of this time is going to be the, the Luke chapter 2, the shepherds. Okay, the angels and the shepherds. It's interesting as we look through all of those different characters, Mary, Zechariah, the shepherds, and Simeon, all, all of them notated and, and said specifically that they were in need of a savior. They all said that. Mary says that. Luke 1, 46 and 47. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. I think think that's important to note. Mary realized she needed a Savior. Verse 50, Mary talks about his mercy for those who fear him. Okay. Zechariah also talks about this salvation. Verse 69, when his tongue is loosed, he talks about this salvation that's going to be raised up. Verse 69. Verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies. Verse 77, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. And then the shepherds, right? What did the angels tell the shepherds? I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. A Savior. Jesus is a humble Savior for humble people. I always find it interesting to think of the grand invitation that's given to such simple people. I don't know, some of you have probably seen, you you see it if you're on Facebook or Instagram, you see people's birth announcements, right? Or gender reveals, okay? Some of them are pretty extravagant, right? Like, wow, they went through a lot of effort to, you know, get the confetti to shoot out of there. And, you know, there's all, all sorts of planning goes into it, these announcements, right? Think of this announcement. It's pretty awesome. So here's these shepherds out on the field. They're, they're just like the lowly people. And here comes an angel. I mean, like, this isn't like a hired angel. You can't hire an angel. You can't like go online and say, you know, give me an angel. Let's hire up an angel for this announcement. Here comes this angel. He announces this. And then after that happens, it says that this whole multitude of heavenly hosts. Okay, so I mean, I've got this little show going in my brain. Of, of here, here's this angel. And all of a sudden behind him, just infinitely behind him, all these angels just begin to appear. That's a pretty amazing announcement. You, you would think that an announcement of that magnitude would be made for, well, to people who really would appreciate it. Not shepherds. I mean, shepherds, really? And there were what, like five, six of them? I mean, how many many were there? We don't even know how many there were. There could have been three, right? There's shepherds out in the field. They're keeping watch over their flocks. And here's this huge, I mean, this massive announcement. And it's given to these lowly, lowly shepherds. Would they even appreciate such a thing? There's humility You see, why had he come? Jesus hadn't come to conquer. He hadn't come to make all people love him and bow and submit to him at this moment. He would come one day to do that. He didn't come to take over politics. Instead, he had come humbly to take our sins and to die. Jesus, the humble Savior. Then notice the humble setting. So here the shepherds, the shepherds come down. They say, whoa, this is amazing, this amazing announcement. They say, let's go see what's happened. Let's go go look for it. And what did the the angels say to them? There's going to be a sign that that will verify this for you. The sign is this. This Savior who just had this amazing angelic announcement is going to be in a food trough. Okay, he's going to be in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. It's kind of like, what? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to fit. And yet the, the shepherds come and they find this humble scene where nobody, I mean, nobody in the world is looking for it. It's this humble scene of Mary, Joseph, and then there's the baby lying in a manger. Have you 
Have you ever wondered at the humility of the Savior? Jesus was not humbled just at his birth, but the Bible tells us that he was humble throughout his entire ministry on this earth. Think of him standing before the judge, before Pilate, silent. Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he was humble to the point of death. So we, we could talk for quite a while about the humiliation or the, the humbleness, you might say, of Jesus here. God becoming flesh. The creator becoming like the created ones. Wow. The humility of the creator to allow the creature to crucify him. That's humble. Jesus is humble. And in fact, I would suggest this. Part of the reason for the responses that we've seen throughout the Gospels is because of the humility of Jesus. You know why Herod and Jerusalem were astounded at this and, and, and were troubled? Well, it's because Jesus was, was humble. They weren't looking for a Savior to come humbly. Jerusalem and the religious leaders, they weren't looking for a, a Savior, a Messiah to come humbly. They wanted a Messiah who's going to come in pride and come and just wipe out their enemies and establish his rule and reign. And so the humility of Jesus actually becomes a stumbling block for people. And you know what? It still is a stumbling block today. God becoming a man? Come on, really? Yeah. So the humility of Jesus. Jesus is the humble Savior for humble people. He willingly allows his creation to crucify him. So I think that the, these responses, one of the reasons for these responses is because of the humility of Jesus. There's another reason why I think we have these responses, and that is that Jesus in, actually invites people to come to him. Okay? Jesus invites people to respond to him. Jesus invites all who will respond to him. And this is still true today. Jesus invites every single person here to respond to him, to come to him. It's interesting that Jesus doesn't decry investigation. He doesn't. He doesn't. In fact, you're, you're welcome to investigate Jesus. Mary investigates. She says, how can this happen? Okay? I'm a virgin. I, I've never slept with a man before. How am I supposed to have a baby? The shepherds, they say, well, let's go see this thing. Let's go find it. Let's go evaluate. Let's go investigate. The wise men, what do they do? They see the star and they investigate. They go, they follow, they search for a very long time. They seem to be searching. So investigation is actually something that seems to be welcomed. What do the angels tell the shepherds? You will what? You will find the baby. You will find the baby. You know what? If you're willing to investigate, Jesus, you can find him. However, you can't investigate the way that Herod investigated, because Herod investigated too, right? But Herod's investigation did not include any type of faith. Rather, it was total unbelief. Unbelief that this person had, was allowed to have any significance an impact on his life. In fact, he was going to do everything he could to thwart any type of impact that, that he would have. There was not this submissive, let me submit to the God of the universe who just became flesh. It was, you know what, I don't like this, I, the idea of this person rising up and threatening my throne. You even have Zachariah's investigation of John the Baptist, but it seems that it wasn't filled with faith. It was filled with, with unbelief, right? That's what the angel says, because you did not, what, believe. So when it comes to investigating Jesus, there are historical realities listed. Luke did that in chapter 1. He mentions it, and actually all through his gospel, there's all these historical anchor points to which he's, he's putting all of this story in. You can investigate it. Chapter 2, verse 1. What does it say, right? In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. He's, he's constantly anchoring these things in, in different historical events. 
There's also these matter-of-fact statements, right? Verse 15. What does it say? It says, And when the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to, to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened. <laughs> They're saying, Let's go see this thing that has happened. There was already an acceptance of it, right? Let's go see this thing that has happened. It's a matter-of-fact statement. Verse 20, And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. So they were told, and then they went and they heard and they saw. So when you hear the message of Jesus, I want you to know you can't investigate it. But I will say that your presupposed bias will affect how you investigate. If indeed dead people don't rise, blind people don't see, virgins don't give birth, if that's how you're approaching this, well then you, you, you probably see where you're going to land, right? You can investigate, but what I see from these texts is that you actually need to investigate in faith. We say, okay, Lord, I really want to know. I want to see. I want to understand. And I'm actually willing to submit. And I'm willing to to do that. You see submission in all of these responses. The confirmation of faith is actually obedience. So here's Joseph, right? Joseph, he's dreaming and he has, the angel comes and talks to him. What does he do? He obeys. The invitation of Jesus to find him is still open. Jesus, all through his life, invited people, come, follow me. Be followers of me. Many came and saw him for what he was, and they followed. Others came to see what they wanted to see and to get what they wanted. There's one more thing I want to draw your attention to in this particular regard. If you go through all these responses, many of them specifically mention the role of the Holy Spirit in the response of the individual. So you look at um, Mary, Elizabeth, Zechariah, Simeon, All of them, specifically, it talks about how the Holy Spirit was influential in their response to Jesus. And so I just want to say this. The Holy Spirit is actually the one that's going to be working in hearts to convince, to convict, and to draw to himself. So let's not not forget that. Let's not forget that it's actually the work of the Spirit inside of you, in you personally, convincing you of, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is going to be the one that's doing the work, drawing you to himself. He's the one working in the hearts, the one leading people to come to the temple at that exact time. And he is the one who, at this very moment, may be working in your heart, drawing you, inviting you, pressing the invitation, the gospel call for you to come and respond to Jesus. Come investigate Jesus. If you respond to his working in your life, you will as the shepherds did, you will find him. There's another reason why I think the responses are all similar and in this way. And it's because Jesus transforms those who meet him. Jesus transforms those who meet him. It's interesting that there's always a turn. After they saw it, after they heard it, or after they, they, they were there, they leave doing something. Almost every one of them. They leave glorifying and praising God. Right? Right? Look at verse 20 again of chapter 2. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. If you look at the wise men in Matthew chapter 1, they come to the house and they see and they fall down and they worship. They worship Jesus and then they give him the gifts. So, there's this obedient trust that results in this worshipful praise and adoration. There's one more, one more element that I want us to notice of people who were in this scenario, and that is the people who just heard, right? Okay. With Anna, she goes around and just tells people. So she begins to speak of him to all who are waiting for the redemption 
of Jerusalem. Right? The shepherds, it says that when they see it, they make known abroad what had been told them concerning the child, right? And what does it say? And all who heard it, what did they do? They wondered. Well, why were they wondering? I think it's because of these three things. They're wondering at the humility of Jesus. What? He's so humble. This, this is not what we expected. It's paradigm shifting. Wait, if I'm really going to believe that, I've got to submit to this. There's an invitation for everybody. And Jesus will transform you if you come to him. The hearts of those who find him rejoice. The sinner finds forgiveness. Those in chains find freedom. The proud find humility. The humble find exaltation. The weak find strength. The filthy find cleansing. The despairing find hope. And on on we could go. When you find Jesus... He will transform your life. And I, I don't mean by that, by the way, that, that you're going to have your best life now. <laughs> okay? Come find Jesus, and now everything's going to be hunky-dory. Okay? And that whatever you want to pray for is going to happen. And that you're guaranteed it's going to happen. It's not taught in the Bible. Okay? However, we are guaranteed our best life then. Okay? Then. When is that? Well, it's at the resurrection of the dead, okay, in the future. It's in heaven when we're fully in the presence of this one, this humble one who came to the earth to take your sin to mind, to take our guilt, our shame, right? That's when we'll see this fully come to fruition. However, Jesus does transform and he does begin to change those who meet him. They all leave the same way. They all leave worshiping, praising God, giving thanks, glorifying, and telling other people around. So let me just ask some questions for you today. If you've met Jesus, which a lot of you, I think, would say, I've met Jesus, let me ask you some questions. Are you thankful? Do you glorify God with your body, with your mind, with your affections, with your will? Do you sing his praises? You find yourself rejoicing in God, your salvation. And do you tell other people about it? Do you tell other people about it? Hey, let me tell you about Jesus, my salvation. Let me tell you about this one who came to earth and humbled himself, took my sin, died for me. That seems to be the response of all of those who meet the Savior from the very beginning. From the very beginning, we see this. We see it through the rest of the Gospels. And guess what? We've seen it for for a thousand, for two thousand years now in the church. As people who have really genuinely met Jesus, they're transformed by him and they worship, praise, and honor him. You can't come in pride. You must come in humility. Seeking him investigating him, responding to the invitation, and those who believe in him will never be put to shame. In closing, I want to look at the passage that actually um, Scott mentioned and referenced in the beginning. John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 9, it says, The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The next verse kind of encapsulates the whole Christmas story, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Have you seen this son? Have you seen this light? Have you seen Jesus? Have you met him? Kind of referenced in the very beginning, that sometimes we can confuse all of the emotions and activities of the Christmas season with devotion to the Lord. I just want to say something, that that, 
your involvement in Christmas activities doesn't necessarily reveal that you're a follower of Jesus. What matters is what, what will you do with him the next month and the next month after that, the next year? What will you do with him for the rest of your life? How will you respond to him? You'll respond in one of two ways. You'll either receive him, and in receiving him and observing him and noticing him, he'll change you, he'll transform you, or you can reject him. But if you reject life, your only other option is death. If you reject light, the only other option is darkness. And so I would implore you, I would implore every one of you, come to the light. Seek and find. Investigate Jesus. Go to the word. Read it. Evaluate it. Humble yourself before it. And if you will receive Jesus, I can guarantee you he will transform you you. He will change you because that's what he does. Every person in this room will respond to Jesus. You will. Each one should respond in joyful trust and worship. Right? Worshipful obedience. Why? Well, because Jesus is the humble Savior. And Jesus has invited every single one of you to come and find him. To seek and to find him. And Jesus also says, come to me and I will what? I will, I'll transform you. I will change you. For those three reasons, I think that every single person in here should have a joyful trust and a worshipful response to Jesus, the Christ of Christmas. How will you respond to Christ even this Christmas? Would you pray with me this this, this morning? Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, you know all the hearts of everybody in this room. Lord, you know some who who don't believe, who have never submitted themselves, have never humbled themselves. Lord, you know the hearts, and I pray that you would use your word. I pray that your spirit would be drawing. Lord, that this season would not just be a season for, uh, for fun and games and family and festivities, But instead, it would be a time when we evaluate and we look at even our response to you. And Lord, I pray that if anybody here in this room does not know you as their Savior, they've never met you, they've never been introduced to Jesus, I pray that even this morning, they would begin with humble, submissive investigation. And they would come to you They would take you at your word and that they would find you for exactly who you've said you are. I pray that we as believers would leave here worshipful, joyful, trusting. But Lord, that we'd also leave here telling others of the wonder of Jesus. That others would see and want to come and investigate as well because of the things that we we have seen, the things that we have heard as it has been told to us. We ask this in Jesus' name.